If you have ever been to Dovestones Reservoir, you might not know that just a little further up the road, past Bing Green, was the site of one of the most horrific and gruesome bloody murders in the area's history. On Monday, the 22nd of April, 1832, Thomas Bradbury, a large, well-built, muscular man, with a fiery temper, a gamekeeper by trade, came down from the misty moor, crossing the long grass that wet the bottom of his pants around the boots. He was walking back to his home he shared with his father. He was returning from Wessenden, a camp of gypsies known as the Burns Platters. Thomas had been charging rent, so that they could stay and collect broom from the moors to weave into baskets. Thomas stumbled down the rocky dirt path. A squat stone building appeared in front of him, standing proud like a fortress against the harsh weather that can suddenly appear on the moors. Thomas noticed smoke gently rising from the chimney. He smiled to himself. He knew it was going to be warm when he got home. The inn used to be his father's farmhouse. But in 1810, a new road from Greenfield to Homeforth was planned. So his father, William, applied for and got an alcohol licence and renamed the farmhouse Shooter's Arms. In 1828, Thomas's mother, Mary, died. And Thomas was also caught having an affair with another woman who had at least two of his children. So Thomas moved back in to live with his father, William. When Thomas got back to the inn, he called out to his father, but when he got no reply and saw the fire was reduced to embers in the hearth, he knew the old man was out. The time was round 6.30, when there was a knock at the door. Walking over, Thomas lifted the latch and swung back the heavy door, and in walked an older man, the family friend, Mr Rubin Platt. The two men sat for a while, chatting and drinking beer, when Thomas said to Reuben that he needed to travel to the local town of Greenfield, which was around two miles away, to get some candles, tea and sugar from the shop, to see them through the week. Reuben told Thomas it wasn't a problem, he would go with him and he was heading home anyway. So closing the door to the front room to keep in the heat, they locked the front door on the way out. The two men set off to Greenfield. They walked down the narrow dirt road from the inn, with the boots crunching on the loose stones. About 15 minutes into the walk, they met William, Thomas's father, walking back to the inn. They talked briefly, and Thomas gave his father the door key and some of the loose change he had on him. He told his father he would see him soon, and they parted ways, with Reuben and Thomas carrying on to Greenfield. A little further down the path, the two men saw three other men leaning against a dry stone wall. Thomas looked carefully. He could see they had been spotted, as the three men were now walking towards him, talking amongst themselves. Thomas suddenly realised he knew one of the men. But he said nothing to Reuben. The men stopped just a little in front of Thomas and Reuben. The men looked rough, slightly dirty like labourers, navvies from the local area. The man in the middle jerked his head up slightly, acknowledging the two men. And he said, in an Irish accent, How long did it take to get to home for Earth? Looking at the man and his two companions, Thomas replied, It's about eight miles that way. Thomas and Reuben carried on, but Thomas had a sickening feeling in his stomach. He couldn't help but feel worried about his elderly father alone at the inn. Thomas told Reuben he had had altercations with one of the men a year ago when they suspected the man of stealing from them. As he watched these three men slowly trudge up the path towards the inn, 
Thomas kept glancing over his shoulder. But he stopped completely when the three men were right outside the inn. He held his breath, watching helplessly. But he breathed a sigh of relief as the men carried on walking past the inn and off out of sight. And the two men carried on. Thomas passed the cottage of his estranged wife as they got into town, but as soon as the two friends reached Greenfield, they went their separate ways. Thomas went to the shop, and after getting his supplies, he set off on his two mile walk back home. As the dawn came, mist still hung around the stone inn, and William's 12 year old granddaughter, Amelia Winterbottom, walked down the path towards the inn. Her mother had sent her to borrow some yeast from her grandfather so they could bake bread. She knocked on the wooden door and pushed it open. She knew it would be unlocked. She called out for her grandfather and then her uncle. But there was no sound. The girl could hear her own heartbeat pounding in her ears. And how loud her footsteps sounded on the wooden floor in the deafening stillness. She looked right into the first room. She let out a scream. <coughs> Lay face down on the floor, covered in blood, was a man she couldn't recognise. It was her uncle. So savagely beaten, he was unrecognisable. The blood was everywhere. The windows, the walls, the fireplace, the furniture, the stone floor. Young Amelia ran to find her grandfather, taking her one stairs two at a time. When she reached his room, she saw he had been viciously attacked too. And with that, she raced from the inn. She ran to the nearest neighbour, at Bing Green, 500 yards down the hillside. A messenger was sent to nearby Upper Mill, requesting police and a doctor, as the neighbours raced back to the inn. When the doctor finally arrived, both men were still alive. Just. A newspaper from the time reported. Thomas Bradbury was still on the floor. For such was the terror created by the spectacle. That those who had before arrived were incapable of affording him any assistance. He was lying on his face in a pool of blood with which his clothes were soaked. His head and face appeared to be a mess of clotted gore. Though apparently unconscious, he made frequent attempts to rise from the floor. But each time he sunk again into the pool of blood from which he'd been lying. At this time, pulsation had ceased in the wrist. And he was in fact struggling with the agonies of death. The doctor and neighbours carried Thomas upstairs to his bed where they started cleaning him and dressing his wounds. But no sooner had they started, Thomas Bradbury passed away due to his injuries. His father William was in and out of consciousness. He was covered in bruises. His fingers on his left hand had been severed. The muscles too in his left arm were cut down to the bone and he had a deep gash on the left side of his head that would not stop bleeding. He was incoherent and insensible, but he was talking. The doctor, Mr Higginbottom, tried to question Bill over and over. Who did this to you? Who was it? What happened? But none of the replies made any sense. But William's strength was now failing. With his last breath, he mumbled one word to the doctor. And in the early hours, he too, like his son, died of his injuries. The police, on investigating the property and the bodies of the two men, found near Thomas an open Bible on the table, like it was being read at the time of the attack. Near Thomas was found a blood-stained broken shovel that lay on the ground. This was later found to be one of the weapons used and broken in the ferocity of the attack. A cavalry pistol was found outside the inn, covered in blood and hair. 
and a fire poker and an auger used as weapons were all left at the scene of the crime. The inn had been robbed of anything of value, including seven pound and some items of clothing. The police found the candles that Thomas had bought earlier still in his bloodstained pocket. The police reported that Thomas had 16 wounds to his head. Two of these had fractured his skull. He had defensive wounds all over his body. It also seemed that William was attacked in the downstairs pantry, near his son. But from the blood trail and his blood soaked stockings, looked like he had managed to get himself upstairs into his bedroom where young Amelia had found him. With no survivors or witnesses, police turned to the final words of William. But the doctor was unsure what William had actually said. Was it Platts, like Thomas's friend's surname? Or was it Pats, a derogatory name for the Irish used at the time? Was it the three Irish men who had been seen earlier? Had they come back? Had they lain in wait on the moors waiting to attack? Or was there any Irishman at all? Now with Thomas and William dead, the tale of the three Irishmen came down only to Reuben Platt, who adamantly said he was certain the Irishman had killed William and Thomas Bradbury. That will about do it, but to let you know, it was suggested that when Thomas came home from Greenfield, he walked in on the robbery of three Irishmen beating his father in the pantry and then set about him when he walked in. Also, there was the Roman Irish gypsy family of the Platters in the area who lived outside the law, taking things into their own hands, who Thomas had been extorting money from, and occasionally roughed them up, and often threatened to throw them off the moor by force. Family friend Reuben was also a suspect, as he could have gone back to the inn after leaving Thomas in Greenfield, and attacked William, and waited for Thomas to come home. Also under suspicion was the local poachers, as the chief witness against them was Thomas Bradbury. The case was actually dismissed the day after because Thomas could not testify. The poacher, Red James Bradbury, had boasted in court that Thomas Bradbury would never stand as witness against him. The magistrates hearing the case did not know of the Bill of Jack's murders. They became suspicious and informed the police, who quickly arrested both the Red Bradburys. Records show that on the evening of the murders, the Red Bradburys had been drinking at New Inn in Upper Mill, only three miles away from the murder scene. On their way home, they would have passed close to the inn. The police and magistrates thought this was too much of a coincidence, and regarded them as key suspects in the murder. However, Father and son had alibis from a family member, and the lack of evidence led them to be released. A man called John Mitchell, who was a labourer, got drunk in a pub one night, and confessed that he knew more about the murders than anybody else. He was then arrested, but charges against him were dropped, as the judge said he was a liar and a drunkard. And finally, in 1853, 21 years after the murder, Mr Robert Whitehead, a man living in Australia, wrote a letter to his brother in Huddersfield that said, It was a young man hawking tape in a basket in Saddleworth who murdered Bill and Tom O'Jacks himself. I was working at repairing the canal in Saddleworth myself at the time. Soon after the murder at Bill O'Jacks, the man went to Leicester where he committed a robbery on a drover for which he was transported to Sydney in Australia. Since coming here, he had committed a murder for which he was hung in Hobart Town. Before being hung, he confessed to me that he had murdered Bill and Tom Bradbury in Greenfield. He said he had no intention of the murder, only to rob the house. He sent the old man upstairs, but he came down again. So he struck him over the head, which disabled him. And then after, he searched the place. He was just about to leave when he saw Tom returning. As Tom entered the door, he knocked him down with a fire poker. An inquest of the murders was held at the King William, the public house in Upper Mill, 
where a verdict of willful murder against some person or persons at present was unknown, was returned after the examination of several witnesses. A hundred pound reward was offered for any information regarding the case. It was never claimed, although it was a huge sum at the time. Thousands of people attended the funeral of Tom and Bill at St. Chad's Churchyard in Upper Mill. There are many others who confessed or were suspected, but I have highlighted the ones who were most likely involved in the case. Just, without the evidence, there was nothing that could be done. The bloodstained Bible and the murder weapons are still on display at Saddleworth Museum. Just to let you know, Pat's comes from St. Patrick, who is a patron saint of Ireland. And Bloom is a large shrub similar in appearance to gorse but without the spines. And the name Billa Jacks refers to a tradition of naming somebody with reference to their father. So Bill, like William Bradbury, was son of Jack Bradbury, hence known as Bill of Jacks, which would mean that Thomas Bradbury would be Tom of Bills. And the inn was called Moorcock Inn in 1840 by Thomas's son, Augustus Bradbury, who took it over. Well, that will do it. But please let me know who you thought committed this horrific unsolved murder. Do you think it was the family friend? Or one of many that said they did it? Or do you think it was the Burns Platz gypsies? Let me know in the comments below. This true story was requested by Laura Caroline. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for your support. Take care.